and to the graduates on a day as beautiful as this, in a place as special as this, I am so thrilled and excited to be here. There are few memories in life as truly indelible as college graduation. You did it! Congratulations! You've paid your dues, literally. Thank you, moms and dads. <laughs> and members of the class of 2010, in the endless hours you've given to your studies. But as I stand here today, on this side of the podium, looking out on the sea of graduates, there is one question that comes to mind. How have I been so fortunate to be in this place on this day wearing a graduation gown twice in my life. Don't get me wrong, as I sat in your seat on a day that feels like yesterday, I had ambition and I had drive and I had all the lessons of Meredith College right here. I was ready to get my life going on the day of my graduation. But I never thought that someday I would be charged with sending a group of accomplished, and incredibly accomplished, competitive, talented, and spirited graduates into the world and away from this place. So how did it happen? How did I end up with the enormous responsibility, which I'm really feeling knowing so many of my professors are sitting behind me, it never ends, <laughs> of giving you the words that will serve as end punctuation for your years at Meredith. I considered telling you stories of my career, how I got my first job, the jobs I've loved, the exciting adventures I've taken, and the lessons I've learned. But each of those paths quickly hit roadblocks because, in truth, the core of my journey to why I am here today has taken place in the same block of time that your path to today has taken, the past four years. You see, just as you were settling back into the dorms for the second semester of your freshman year, do you remember your freshman year? Ready, I'm sure, to jump into new courses of study, I too was about to give, begin my new, own new season of lessons. January was typical, cold and slow, and we celebrated my daughter Ella's first birthday and worried a little over my son Liam's lingering cold. Then, in February of 2007, about the time you were prepping for midterm exams and looking forward to spring break, my greatest test of life was handed to me with the crushing, life-altering, completely shocking news that Liam didn't have just another toddler cold and wasn't just becoming a pickier eater. My sweet son was diagnosed with stage four cancer. Now, I started by commenting on the beauty of this place and this day. And there is a part of me that does not even want to talk about what happened next because I assure you, there is absolutely nothing pretty when talking about pediatric cancer. The words alone are hard to comprehend. It took me weeks before I could even say them. I don't want anyone to face cancer. I don't want anyone to go through the toxic exhausting treatments of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and other painful and invasive therapies. I don't want anyone to face the fears that come with such a big diagnosis, but I especially don't want a child, any child, my child, to face these challenges. It's not right, and it goes against the laws of human nature. So I will tell you now, in those first days and weeks after Liam's diagnosis, as we learned the risks involved with pediatric cancer treatment, I can assure you I was definitely not dreaming of someday speaking to a graduating class about the gifts of their college experience. But while my mind was focused on Liam's treatment, my soul 
was waking up to the reality that my entire life, and especially my time at Meredith, had prepared me in both ordinary and extraordinary ways for facing the battle my son was enduring with neuroblastoma, one of the more cowardly forms of pediatric cancer. The first awakening came just days after his diagnosis. You see, the hospital where Liam began his treatment and is still receiving treatment to this day treats more children with cancer than any other hospital. It's actually a booming business. And as you all can relate, one of the earliest lessons I learned during my time at Meredith is the importance of research. So one of my first objectives after receiving the news of Liam's diagnosis was to gather information by talking with another mother who had been through the same experience. I needed to hear what I was about to face, what I was up against, and to get a pep talk. I suppose I also wanted a big sis, someone who had gone down the path before me who could guide me through the experience. I was feeling vulnerable and scared. No, not scared, terrified. I was given the phone number for a woman named Shirley Staples. Shirley, an accomplished Manhattan attorney, is, more importantly, the mommy of Simon, now 16, who was diagnosed with the same stage of the same insidious type of cancer as Liam, around the same tender age as my precious son. I called her and with a shaky voice told her who I was. She immediately welcomed me. I told her I needed her help and began asking her a million questions. We talked and talked and talked. She was a wealth of information and comfort. She talked me off the figurative ledge. At the end of our conversation, when I felt the strength returning to my legs to the point that they could carry me back to Liam's hospital room, I told her something very uncharacteristic for me. I told her I had a feeling she was going to be the angel to get me through this experience. I had never said those words to somebody before. She was a source of light in my darkest hour. She was hope. She was an angel in my world of fear, and she became my friend. In the months that followed, Shirley was a steady voice on my shakiest days. Every time I needed a lifeline, she would be there writing me long, beautiful prose that had a certain signature style. But it was only by chance, when I mentioned on Liam's blog about being a Meredith angel, did Shirley and I realize the depth of our connection.